Do you see that? I just spilled something on this shirt just prior to filming this video. In any case, I'm not changing it now, so we're just going to have to live with it. Hopefully it'll dry pretty quickly in this weather. Welcome to a very professional, a British audiophile. And for those of you who don't know me already, my name is Taron. Today I'm looking at the Denifrips digital to digital converter, the Iris model. They have some other ones higher up the range. Most of us understand what a digital to analog converter does. It takes the musical signal that's been encoded in a digital format, ones and zeros, and converts it into the analog waveforms that represent music. But why would you want a digital to digital converter? Is it just to convert from one digital format to another? Well, that's part of it, but that isn't the reason why you'd buy something like the Denifrips Iris. There are three things that you ideally want from a digital signal transfer. The first thing is that you want lossless bit perfect transmission. Now that's pretty much buttoned down these days as long as you use a USB connection and your music's encoded in either the WAV, FLAC or the Apple ALAC codex. The second thing that you want is for the electrical noise to be as low as possible. That could be noise that's picked up by RF or other EMI or noise generated within the circuitry itself. The power components within the circuitry of a device can in particular be electrically noisy and if left unchecked can upset the sensitive components within a DAC. The third thing that you ideally want from digital signal transmission is low levels of jitter. This is problems with the timing of the information itself. It's been shown that levels of jitter can affect adversely the operation of a DAC in objective, quantifiable, measurable ways. And there's people out there that provide this kind of data, but it's not something that I provide. And it's because you need the right kind of equipment and it's quite a time consuming process to provide measurements. So I commend those that do it. Focus of my videos tends to be on explaining some of the engineering concepts behind the products that I review and to share with you my own subjective thoughts as to whether it makes an audible difference in the systems that I test it with. So if you're interested in that, you may want to watch the rest of this video. The Denfrips Iris retails for £600 in the UK. The all metal black chassis is the same size as the Denfrips Ares 2 DAC that I reviewed measuring 220 by 250 by 62 millimeters and weighing three and a half kgs. That's 8.7 by 9.8 by 2.4 inches and 7.7 .7 pounds. Controls on the front are restricted to just one setup button. This can be used to connect to external clocks and configure the pin layout if using the I squared S outputs. There's no power button as Denifrips intends for you to leave the device permanently running. There are a series of LEDs to indicate PCM and DSD file sample rate. On the rear you'll observe that there's just one USB input. The two B and C inputs are to be connected if you want to use even better quality external clocks than the internal one. You're well served with digital outputs with a coaxial RCA, optical TOSLink, professional AES EBU and I2S outputs on HDMI and RJ45. Now this section is going to get a little bit techy, I apologize, but I'm going to try and keep things as simple as possible, so hopefully most of you can follow me along this journey. There's two things that fundamentally the Denifrips Iris is designed to do. One is to lower the electrical noise, and the second is to lower the amount of jitter that arrives at the DAC. So let's start with the electrical noise first. There's two ways to lower electrical noise that's commonly used. First is to use a isolation transformer. This is known as galvanic isolation. It relies on a principle known as electromagnetic induction. The windings on the primary coil of the transformer are not electrically connected to the windings on the secondary coil. The signal is transferred magnetically, electromagnetically to be precise. And because there is no electrical connection between the primary and the secondary, the signal is transferred, but the electrical noise in the wires is not. You won't find this feature on cost-effective DACs, but some high-end DACs do have this built in. For example, Denifrips Pontus II has galvanic isolation on all its digital inputs. Another way of isolating a signal from noise is to convert it into light. This is called optical isolation, and this is what you have inside the Denifrips Iris. All the digital outputs are optically isolated. If you're connecting the iris to the Pontus, you're actually doubling up on the isolation. The signal is isolated when it leaves the iris by optical means and it's isolated again when it enters the pontus by galvanic means. Overkill and pointless? Well no, not necessarily. No isolation technique is perfect when it comes to implementation, so by doubling up you're actually lowering the noise floor. 
That's the isolation covered. What about jitter itself? Well, this is where things get a little bit more complicated, but I'm going to explain things as simply as I possibly can. Inside digital devices themselves, the data, the digital data is handled in a format known as I squared S. This is where you have separate lines carrying information. One line carries the ones and zeros, the data itself, but you also have a master clock that's responsible for the overall timing of information. And you also have a word clock, which is on a separate line, and that's responsible for identifying the packets of information. Digital data, the ones and zeros, are called bits. Eight bits of data represent a byte, and those bytes are then packaged together in these packets and sent along. When you want to transfer digital signals out of a device, there's a number of ways of doing it. The oldest and most established method is known as the Sony Philips Digital Interface, SPDIF for short. And there's various types of connections. Quite commonly, you'll see a coaxial connection with an RCA, sometimes with a BNC connector as well. There's also an optical connection known as TOSLINK, short for Toshiba Link, named after the people who actually developed it. You find this type of connection on the back of CD transports, Blu-ray players, gaming consoles, TVs, just to name a few. The problem with using that type of connection, if you've got a fairly resolving system and you're connecting to an external DAC, is that the data that was handled internally inside your transport in the I squared S format, where it has a separate line for the master clock, the word clock, and the data itself, is now multiplexed into one signal and then transmitted externally where it has to be unpicked by the DAC at the other end. The other issue is that the timing of the information isn't handled by the DAC, but the transport. And most transports have a much inferior clock to a decent quality DAC. The result is that the levels of jitter go up quite a bit, and that can be quite a problem. The industry tried to address this issue by lowering the levels of jitter with the advent of USB audio, which became popularized in the 1990s when computer-based audio was starting to gain momentum. You can think of your streamer as really a dedicated computer for audio purposes, for the purposes of our discussion here today. It worked by making the DAC responsible for the timing of the information as opposed to the transport. And this is still referred to as an asynchronous connection. The other thing that I think is really cool about what USB audio does is it holds the digital information inside the DAC in something known as a FIFO buffer. Now FIFO just stands for first in, first out. But by holding it in that buffer, you can actually check with the transport to make sure that the information sent from the transport is a bit perfect copy of the information it's holding. So you might think that that's the jitter problem solved right there. Well, in reality, it doesn't work like that. Nothing works perfect in operation. So the harder that buffer has to work, well, the overall levels of jitter and the electrical noise in the DAC itself start to increase. What you're starting to see more and more on high-end DACs, like the Denifrips Pontus II that I reviewed, is an I squared S input. Even USB audio multiplexes the signal. The master clock, the word clock, and the data is sent as one signal and has to be unpicked by the DAC at the other end, impacting on levels of jitter. By using an I squared S input, you're actually getting around the problem as long as your transport has an I squared S output. Most transports don't, but I hope this will change in the near future. This is where the Denifrips Iris comes in. It takes that digital signal, unpicks it, isolates it from noise, and then sends it to a DAC that has an I squared S input, something like the Denifrips Pontus II. And you could argue that the Denifrips Pontus II can do that itself, but there's one thing that's really important to note. The I squared S transfer is not asynchronous. It's not the DAC, but it's the transport that's responsible for the timing of the information. That means you need a really good quality clock inside the transport. Most transports don't have one. The quality of the clock inside the Iris is better than the one inside the Pontus II. In fact, it's the same quality of clock that's fitted to the more expensive Venus II, and that's why it has a positive impact on the overall levels of jitter. Now I get it, there's quite a bit to understand and get your head around if you're new to this stuff, but I did think it was quite important to explain all of this so that you have some understanding of what this device is about and how it operates. There's one more thing that I want to explain before I move on to the next section. There's more to a good clock than the quality of the crystal oscillator, but it's fair to say that the quality of the crystal oscillator does have a significant bearing on the quality of the clock. The Denifrips Aries II and the Pontus II use femto crystal oscillators by a company called NDK. Femto refers to the precision of the oscillator. 
As good as those NDK oscillators are, they are voltage controlled crystal oscillators, which is what you find in most DACs. But the problem with voltage controlled crystal oscillators are that the stability and therefore the output of the oscillator varies with temperature. The Denfrips Venus DAC and the Iris digital to digital converter that I'm reviewing for that matter use temperature compensated crystal oscillators. That has a little thermistor circuit in there that accounts for variations in temperature in an attempt to stabilize the output. Denfrips highest tier of DACs are the Terminator and the Terminator Plus. They use oven controlled crystal oscillators. They're larger, more expensive and require more power, but they do have their own enclosure, which is thermally insulated from the outside. Inside are heating elements that maintain the oscillator at its optimum temperature, and that's why they're most stable. They're also used for sensitive satellite navigation purposes. I'm not going to spend ages droning on about sound quality because this video is going to be long enough. So let's just cut to the chase. Did I notice an improvement in sound quality when I inserted the Denifrips Iris in between my Aurelic Aries Mini and the Denifrips Pontus II DAC? And the answer is yes, the overall clarity improved and it affects everything. The base was tighter, the top end was airier, the transients in the mid range were sharper, the decays more prominent. Perhaps the most noticeable trait was how easeful the dynamics became and also the sense of space and air you have. Now I didn't notice a huge amount of difference in sound stage width but that probably is my room. I did notice an improvement in sound stage depth. And the location of instruments within the soundstage was just a little bit more focused and solid. All my comments relate to using the I squared S connection between the Iris and the Pontus II for the reasons I explained earlier in this video. And that's where my primary listening was done. But I did also try the coaxial connection between the two. And again, there was an improvement. It wasn't as dramatic. In fact, the sound quality, even with the Iris II inserted using the coaxial connection, wasn't still at the same level as the USB connection directly from my Aries Mini to the Pontus II. So the USB connection makes more difference than using the Iris with the coaxial connection. That's what I'm trying to say. Denfrips markets the Iris as something to use with computer-based audio to effectively clean up the USB signal coming out of your computer. So I use my Toshiba notebook running J River, and that's a good little PC. It's a low-powered CPU, means that it isn't particularly noisy as far as computers go. Again, it improved the sound quality with the iris inserted between the computer and the DAC, but not to the same level as what my Aurelic Aries Mini does directly with the USB connection to the Pontus II. So it's a similar story with the iris if you're using it with a computer as it is if you're using it with a coaxial connection. It improves the sound, but not to a level that you'd get if you're using a decent transport and a USB connection directly to the Pontus. If you're considering something like Denifrips Iris, I think it's useful to know what level your system needs to be at in order to take advantage of the sonic benefits that I'm describing. My primary listening was done using my Product Response 1 SEs because they're the most revealing speakers I had to hand, and also my Exposure 21 Pre and 18 Super Mono Blocks for the same reasons. And that's where I noticed the greatest difference. But I did also try my Hegel H160 amplifier and again, the improvements were there across the board, not as dramatic for sure, but still prevalent. The Hegel H160 is a fine sounding amplifier for 2,500 pounds, but it doesn't have the sound staging ability of my Exposure 21 Pre and 18 Super Mono Blocks, nor is it able to unearth that fine micro detail, nuanced timbral information in the mid range that the exposures can uncover. It's quite understandable given the price really. So my advice is that if you've got amplifiers at that kind of price point and you've got the Pontus II and you're considering the Iris as an upgrade, I'd actually consider upgrading your amplification first. Time to wrap things up. If you've got a DAC like the Denifrips Pontus II or something of similar quality with an I2S input, adding the Denifrips Iris is a no brainer. It'll improve the sound quality. I suspect it takes the Pontus II much closer to the performance of the Venus II. It's a pretty cost-effective upgrade. £600 is going to be a lot cheaper than selling your Denifrips Pontus II and buying the Venus. Just make sure that your amplification and your speakers are up to the job. And it's a similar story with the digital transport. You want to be making use of that I2S input to get the best out of it. If you're relying on the other inputs, 
coaxial or optical, well, you need to look at your digital transport and upgrade that first. It's a similar story for those of you who are using a regular computer for streaming duty as opposed to a dedicated streaming transport. That should be upgraded first as a priority. But for those of you who've got that already covered, the Denifrips Iris comes highly recommended. Well, that's it from me. All that remains for me to say is if you like this video, please hit that like button. Please share it. If you like what I'm doing with this channel and you haven't subscribed already, please consider subscribing. And don't forget to check me out on Patreon. There's more content coming on there all the time. So for today, for now, a British audiophile, signing off.